Thank you very much, Terry, for a fantastically generous introduction. Could I first ask all those who know that they are volunteers to start moving and block all the exits, please? Um, you know who you are. There are stewards and marshals waiting for you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, um, you probably thought you'd already paid uh, to come here. And I know that uh, I haven't drawn the most popular straw in being the one who stands between you and Noam and the question and answer session. But the fact is that we at COVID Action Quarterly are quite old hands and have been in this business a long while and we're not about to let a captive audience get away that lightly. Um, we would like you to make a pledge, if you can, and we'll be passing buckets and baskets around for you to put money in, or IOUs, or checks, or any kind of paper currency. Um, I don't know, for example, if I can just start the ball rolling here. Um, how many people here would put their hands up and admit that they pay for home delivery of the Washington Post? That's quite a lot. I, I do it too. I reckon, what, $250 a year for that. I don't see why the government doesn't distribute it free, quite frankly. <laughs> 250 for, you know, for to have a great wadge of consensus dumped on your doorstep. Now, if you'll pay 250 and not really notice it for that, the newspaper that publishes Henry Kissinger as an op-ed contributor, the newspaper of which I have Stern once rather brilliantly said, it's a great paper, the Washington Post, you never know on what page you'll find the front page story. <laughs> that paper, who will put up their hand and say they'll give $250? They'll give the Washington Post equivalent. There you go, into the bucket it goes. Any more? Yes, excellent. Any more of those? Well, you can keep, um, you can keep thinking about it. The offer is not, uh, it was not going to expire with time. Um, while you're writing your check or your pledge or your IOU or, or just tugging at, at your billfold, I'd just like to say a few things about our guest of honor tonight and about, uh, and about CAQ. <laughs> I was rereading Norman Mailer's um, Armies of the Night recently in preparation for an interview I was doing with him, and I came across the wonderful passage where Mailer is arrested in the march on the Pentagon and is thrown into the wagon by the police, who then throw in a member, a uniformed member of the US Nazi party uh, in along with him just to show that the park police have a sense of humor. And as the sort of scene clears a bit, um, he, Mailer realizes that there's a, him and the Nazi and one other, a sort of thin, rather distant, spectacled, slightly Jewish-looking sort of academic guy. And he says, that it turns out to be Noam Chomsky. And I, when we interviewed him later, I said, that must have been an amazing encounter. He said, yes, at the time I had no idea who Noam Chomsky was. But Noam, of course, was, was from the first days of the anti-war movement, not just on the day of that great march on the Pentagon, but on many other days, important days too, in their very front rank, taking the side of the victim calling an aggression by its right name, calling people to the responsibility, the realization that in such a case of aggression, you're morally obliged to stand with the victim. And that contribution, I think, will be remembered. He's often pessimistic about the historical record. I nonetheless think his contribution on that will, will always be remembered as, as quite literally imperishable. He was also there at the funeral of Fred Hampton. He's almost the only white face, I think, who was present at that funeral. Uh, the, the victim being an assassinated dissident, victim of a national political police force, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He went all the way to Managua to offer his solidarity in, in practical and moral forms as a lecturer and as a, and as a friend at the time of the hysterical war of aggression waged against, uh, against Nicaragua by the Reagan administration. And he's also uh, incredibly helpful, open, willing, and friendly for the least person who wants to consult him for, for research and scholarly purposes. I, I recently felt I had to do something about the Charles Murray Richard Hernstein phenomenon, the bell curve phenomenon, where it suddenly discovered that the fault is not in the society, but in the genetic makeup of its uh, lower orders. And I thought, well, probably no one will have something to say about this. After all, he's studied the nature nurture question rather intently, and I rang him up, said, What have you got? He said, Well, I haven't got much recent, really, but. I suppose I did write the paper about Richard Hernstein. Hernstein is really the author, the late Hernstein, rather than Charles Murray, of the Bell Curve, a few years ago. And he sent me the most, the most perfect and most prescient uh, demolition of Richard Hernstein 
that uh, it was possible to imagine. This was at a time when everybody in the country was reviewing that damn book, and where the book was getting a really pretty extensive free ride, and where none of these insights, and none of these findings, and none of these uh, uh, areas of contestation were alluded to at all by the supposedly scholarly reviewers, but you only had to contact the man himself and to, to be, uh, shall I say, without sounding fawning, um, enlightened. Um, he, Noam has been the victim, he's not himself a victim of self-pity in any way, and wouldn't say this for himself, but I can tell you as someone who's followed it that he's been the victim of a really unprecedented campaign of calumny and defamation, and a parallel campaign to silence and exclude and marginalize his contributions. His books go unreviewed in the major outlets, his letters often in, written in defense against appalling libels, are often unpublished or published in a mutilated form. I think he's born under born up under this with tremendous dignity and bearing and, and address. My Chomskyan syllogism, therefore, if I can venture such a thing, is that he has always been there for us, and Covert Action Quarterly will always be and is here for him. And so give generously. How's it going? Is there anyone who hasn't had the bag under their uh, nose yet? Uh, there must be some people at the front, I think. Um, all right, uh, let's see. I want to increase the tempo of giving a little. Um, if what I've just said doesn't move you or stir you, how much would you give to see Barbara Bush in the dock? Or, okay, or any member of the Bush family. Um, I'm offering you Barbara. Um, I had to review her ghastly book the other day. You can always do something, you know, however small. I had to review this damn book for a stupid tabloid. Reading through, and she said that Philip A.G. had given away the name of an American agent in Athens who'd later been assassinated and was morally responsible for this man's murder. And the introduction says that George Bush read every word of the book to protect her from uh, having made any mistakes or committed any uh, errors of fact. So I thought, ha. Huh. I rang Phil in Hamburg. I said, I think you ought to sue her. And he is suing her. And they've already admitted that they're wrong. <laughs> this is good. Do you want, anyone want the buckets back? Um, or write another pledge? Um, He's going to sue, he's suing over several million dollars. Uh, the publisher has already admitted, and the author, the, their guilt in the matter by changing this and excising the libel from the paperback. And our old friend Phil uh, stands actually to be vindicated in the American court. And she might have to come there and take part in it. I'd say, what's that worth to you? I'd say that was worth a few, a few bucks. Um, it's one of those things that cheers you up. Give generously, in other words. When, um, when Phil first started writing about this kind of thing, it amazes me looking at his book now, uh, the, the, the scandal that it caused. We had no idea. He thought it was bad. Phil A.G. helped us to find out how bad, but we and he had not the least idea how bad it really was. It's since his revelations that we've discovered about Frapp, that we've had Jennifer Harbury's revelations of the collusion, direct collusion between the CIA and the death squads in Guatemala, that we've had brilliantly reported also in Covert Action Quarterly the account of the CIA's part in the arrest of Nelson Mandela, the original arrest that led to his, uh, his first trial and, and imprisonment, and the arrest of his wife, Winnie. Um, we've had the Gladio revelations about the plans for military coups in every Western European country in the event of crisis. We've had the Ames uh, fiasco where it seems the taxpayers were paying to have the United States disinform itself, thus, I suppose, cutting out the middleman. And now the revelations that the crystal ball and stargazing faction is considered to be worth 17 million of anybody's money. I've always thought, one, I've often wondered why the Washington Post has an astrology column and a horoscope every day. Now I think I know it was code. They were talking to each other through the Washington Post astrology columnist. Anyway, think, think about that and see much, how much money you can part with. CAQ has always had the goods on the, the foul collusion between the national security state in this country and a network of dictators and psychopathic killers who are ready to rent themselves out to them. I have very often have been lucky enough to be able to recommend visiting journalists from overseas to, to go to the CAQ library, to go through the archive, to write stories in the foreign press that, the sort that you never see here. It's a, it's a service they're very proud and glad to provide and I'm incredibly proud and glad to be able to recommend. Great satisfaction comes of it. So what's it What's it worth to you, is my question, as I hope we can have one more go around. Perhaps I can pluck one more heartstring, rifle one more pocket, open one more billfold. Did you see in the Washington Post yesterday that Dr. Michael Mandelbaum, great foreign policy pundit, 
of the Brookings Institution has issued his final critique of the Clinton administration's foreign policy. This is one that not even Noam, I think, would have believed in his, uh, in his critique of our, um, our vulnerability to our own good intentions. But Dr. Mandelbaum really does say the problem with the Clinton administration uh, is, and its foreign policy is it's so compassionate. It is the foreign policy, says this doctor at the Brookings Institution, of Mother Teresa. Now, if you take my view of Mother Teresa, which is that she's a valet du pouvoir, that she's a servant of right-wing thugs in power and right-wing businessmen on the make, uh, and uh, someone who, li who likes to fool the poor, I suppose you could say that this was the foreign policy of Mother Teresa, but I don't think that was the implication about either her or President Clinton. But it is, I think, still, and perhaps no one will agree, that the benchmark remark about, uh, about how we are really much too kind, much too sweet, much too altruistic, and much too forgiving. I will close with a story that I hope Noam will forgive me telling about him. Um, as we all occasionally do, we had to go to the dentist not long ago. And the dentist said to him, it's okay, your teeth are in good shape, but you're grinding them rather a lot, aren't you? Noam said, no, I'm not. I don't, I'm not aware of grinding them at all. Well, said the dentist, I've heard that before. Um, actually, what's happening, this is common too, is you're grinding them in your sleep. Noam thought, maybe I am. His wife and great partner, the wonderful Carol Chomsky, agreed to sort of have a round-the-clock gnome watch, just to sort of see what's... He wasn't grinding them in his sleep. So they had a more intensive watch, and they found he was grinding them for a 15, 20-minute period every day in the morning while he was going through the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I would just, in closing, therefore, uh, recall for you the great closing uh, words of um, the late... Marshal of the Movement, Joe Hill. Don't grind. Uh, be like Noam. Organize. Bye-bye. Thank you.